Hello everyone, this is Spot and I'm Samar Safi Harp from the Faculty of Science at the University of Manitoba. On behalf of the faculty, I'd like to welcome all of our viewers online today uh, who are joining us for Dr. Purang Irani's talk uh, from Computer Science. Before introducing Purang, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that we are at the University of Manitoba in Treaty 1 territory and that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of Anishinaabe, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Metis Nation. The talk will be 20 minutes long, followed by 20 minutes uh, question answer period. You could start asking your question during the talk itself by going to slido.com and entering the event code E361. And this will keep flashing throughout the talk in case you missed it. Uh, feel free to enter your questions throughout the talk, uh, and you could choose to display your name or remain anonymous. I'll be reading these questions out to the speaker once the question answer period uh, starts. Now, if you, you will be able to see those questions on your Slido screen. So if there is a specific uh, question asked by somebody else who you really like, you could give it a thumbs up and then it will rise to the top. And as a result, we can ask those questions first. Uh, so now it's my pleasure and honor to introduce uh, my colleague, Dr. Purang Irani, uh, our speaker for today. Uh, Dr. Irani is a professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of Manitoba. And he's also a Canada Research Chair in Ubiquitous Analytics. His research is in the areas of human-computer interaction and information visualization. More specifically, his work concentrates on designing and studying novel interactive methods and systems for giving end users efficient access to information anywhere and anytime. He's currently co-leading a training program in health data analytics through which his students are applying ubiquitous analytics techniques to address the current challenges in the field. Dr. Irani's research is advancing information visualization, navigation, and manipulation interfaces on ubiquitous computing platforms to help users derive insights from data. He aims to transform the next generation of mobile and ubiquitous technologies into decision facilitating portals. Dr. Irani, over to you. Welcome. Thank you very much, Samar. Thank you very much for that uh, lovely introduction. And thank you also for the opportunity to speak in this uh, seminar series. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to always share our research um, and the research of uh, students and the work of the students in our in our lab. Um, so uh, I'll just get started. Um, and as Sam I introduced, this is basically a, a, a very quick review or overview of our work on uh, designing interfaces or end user interfaces uh, for allowing people to make, helping people to make decisions and facilitating decision making or sense making in mobile contexts or in situ. So I think we, we, we all agree that we live in an age where information is critical to our daily lives. Um, and not that it's only critical, but we actually heavily uh, depend on it. Uh, and partly this has uh, been the case because of this, what we refer to as the deluge of data or this sort of overabundance of data that happens to be around us and information that happens to be around us. However, regardless of the abundance of this information, it really, um, it, it's, it's not as meaningful unless you can actually use it to uh, help you make sense of that information and to ultimately guide you in making decisions. And so in this context, uh, we define sense making as the process of acquiring knowledge from diverse information sources to make a decision. So it's basically uh, the idea that you are depending and relying on this information to, to come up with a decision. And uh, our, our perspective to this work uh, is that of being able to provide technologies that allow people to tap into this information source, uh, to allow to tap into it both actively as well as passively. So it may be that the systems or the devices that you're equipped with allow you or give you certain types of information that can help you make certain decisions.
or that you actually go about navigating this whole infosphere to come about with the decisions that are needed at the time that you need them. And so when you talk about diverse information sources, really it's, you know, the emphasis is on diverse and it can be really quite broad. Uh, and I'll give some examples. And so I want to make clear that from this very broad perspective of where we, what, what, what sense making is, uh, our work narrows in on specifically the ability to, to use this information uh, from the end user's perspective. So I'll just give some examples and uh, initially start off with talking about sort of what may be uh, coined or termed as passive sense making. And then I'll move on to tools that you've designed more specifically for active uh, sense making. So as I mentioned, the, the information sources that we have access to are quite vast and diverse. And to a large extent, they could be self-generated even. Uh, this could be something like, for instance, eating, which is something common that we do every, every day, uh, perhaps a few times in a day. And um, the idea might be that while eating, uh, one, might be, uh, one might be interested in, for instance, acquiring some information and knowledge about what their patterns of eating may be. And this might be particularly the case if someone is, is, is interested in certain behavioral changes, right? So you may want to be informed on things like how fast am I eating? How much are you eating? Uh, when should I stop eating? And what is my calorie intake among many other things? Um, but there could be other, other kinds of questions as well. So it doesn't really have to be on eating and, and our lab is not really uh, focusing on eating. It's just an example that I use uh, over here to talk about the idea that you, know, you, could, you could benefit from passive sense-making tools to, to, to help users advance and make decisions. So for instance, in this technology year, this is a work that's done by a student, Roya Lutfi, uh, who basically is looking at the idea that you could, you could be identifying using a device that you wear in your ears. And this could be something as common as what, you, you know, what I'm wearing, for instance, here, but enabled with certain additional sensors to detect perhaps the different types of foods you're eating uh, the amount that you're eating and to inform you of this, perhaps if you're interested, you know, so maybe you're trying to, to observe a healthier eating uh, pattern. And so maybe this is something that you may need uh, to, to, to observe that. Um, or you may be watching the amount of calorie intake that you have. So you can do the sensing, we can capture this information and, you know, there are mechanisms that we use and student has used to do this. Uh, there's also always this question of how to communicate this information to the end user, that is the person who is uh, wearing this technology. And there are different ways, and so we also explore this in certain ways. So for instance, here's work of uh, Zoe Zhang, who has looked at uh, ways of um, observing eating patterns, and here he's designed uh, with the lab members uh, a device like a fork. It may look big, so it's just a prototype, uh, but that might sort of stop him or prevent him from eating if he's trying to eat too quickly. And it does this simply, not simply by, you know, vibration or a flashing light, but indeed by actually distorting the device to a point where eating doesn't become possible. Uh, so this form of sense making allows one to observe their patterns both in real time, that is in situ, that is in the context in which the action is taking place. And the, the long term vision of this is perhaps that, you know, such tools and interfaces will allow one to uh, gradually take note of what's happening by themselves or in the environment and, and change their behavior. So these are examples of more or less passive sense making. Uh, active sense making is something is, is on the other hand where we ourselves are engaged actively in seeking out that information. So this could be perhaps one who's interested in making a, a, a taking a trip and uh, acquiring certain information bits. And so you, you may be exposed to this uh, interface already uh, through Google Maps where you can search for information, hotel information, names of these, uh, hopefully, this is something that we can do soon after the pandemic. Uh, I, I'm sure many of us long to be able to travel and, and explore this kind of information. Um, and so on typical interfaces like desktop interfaces, such, such tools have been actually quite well tuned over decades, in fact. Uh, so we've been using desktops, uh, keyboards, and mice for at least over 40 to 50 years. And gradually, obviously, these interfaces have, have become more improved so you have you know here you have uh, split view interfaces you can get an overview and detail uh, of the information you can drill further and get access to you know for instance how much does this place cost for the night but you can even further go down and look at the reviews and all of this is because you're looking perhaps on a large screen perhaps one or two different screens uh, and you have some fairly precise tools at your hand such as a keyboard or a touchpad on your laptop perhaps or even a mouse 
uh, to allow you to select these very small points and interact with it. So in that sense, sense making you know, involves this whole process of going after this information and help you come up with some decision. Now, this process it kind of gets uh, interrupted a little bit uh, when you're considering the fact that you might be wanting to do this more and more in mobility context, that perhaps you're not actually sitting at a desk like I am over here at my office, but that you are on the go. And more and more people are using these mobility devices because of the convenience. Uh, we, as na natural human beings, we are always seeking some form of convenience and, you know, further progress. And so the convenience that the devices have is something that we won't exchange for, the ability to be able to put them in our pockets, walk around or in on our bags and walk around and be able to interact with them. Um, and so the idea that these unfortunately are limited has led to uh, this, this uh, the idea of, well, in terms of interacting with big data, and when I mean big data means large infospheres, uh, anywhere, anytime, typically these interfaces can be quite limited. And this, uh, along with a colleague of mine several years ago, uh, allowed us to coin this term uh, ubiquitous analytics, which refers to this ability to design interfaces and tools and user interfaces to interact with information anywhere and anytime. So in the context of you know being able to interact with this information while you're on the go, we observed that, well, indeed, we have a very powerful engine at our disposal, such as a mobile device. But on the other hand, the display is extremely limited. It has a fairly small viewport, and it's through this small viewport that we're indeed looking at the entire amount of sphere of information that we, we potentially have access to. But the, the input is also limited. It's interacting on, obviously, the capabilities of the device itself, and therefore, it, it doesn't allow us to go further or beyond what is typically available on the device. So, in our work, and this is work done by uh, previous students here, Scarlett Hassan's work, uh, as well as every other students, Shingbang Yang and others, who've looked at, well, if you have a mobile device, is there any value to be able to extend its input space beyond that of the actual touchscreen? And we can think of the space around the user as actually being a very, amount, very valuable space, a very valuable physical space and spatial environment to allow, to, allow us to interact beyond having to pre precisely select icons uh, beyond having to be uh, occluding the icons that happen to be beneath our interface. And so they explored this idea of uh, around device interaction, uh, the idea being that you want to be able to navigate information content using the space around you. And perhaps that, can, that could lead to interfaces that might be efficient, uh, particularly in mo mobility context. Uh, so here's an example of how it may work. You may be browsing some information such as uh, camera, cameras, and you may want to make a purchase, for instance, uh, and this is your typical interface that you would use. So you'd go through a list, uh, click on items, drill down. But in an around device interaction, as you observe in the top left corner, the, the person is actually interacting around them. And that information gets updated on the screen. So their position is being tracked. Uh, and I'll talk about how this happens in our lab in a moment. You notice trackers there. We then observe the user's um, ability to do that and look at the user experience. Uh, because ultimately what we are interested in is what's the experience users will engage with in such devices. And in this example here, we equipped a phone with an omnidirectional camera, as you see up on the top left of the phone, and it's able to track the user's finger in that around device space uh, with a fair amount of precision. And uh, as a result of that, you're, you're one is able to, instead of having to flick or navigate or zoom, for instance, on a map, you could just simply have to browse around it to get the information and carry out certain tasks. Uh, so these around device interfaces have been quite interesting for us. And, and you know, we've explored it to, and the student, Khaled Hassan particularly, has explored it to a significant amount of depth, uh, particularly also looking at other aspects of it, such as, you know, is it socially acceptable to be interacting with around the device, uh, perhaps in a public space? Um, so uh, here, you, you, you know, you may get the attentions of passerbys. Uh, so it may be socially awkward for oneself, or it may also be physically uncomfortable. So he, he further looked into this, and it turns out that actually such forms of mid-air interaction, not only are they actually quite efficient, uh, that to a certain extent, they are, can be quite fairly comfortable. Uh, but beyond a certain range, obviously, they become either very uncomfortable or socially unacceptable to the point where one may, may want to not look awkward uh, within a certain environment. And so there have been a number of studies we've done in our lab to also look at the, uh, the social acceptability components of such types of interactions. So not only beyond designing the systems and the uh, end user sort of um, experience, 
but also the implementation as well as the sort of uh, acceptability from it on a, on, a, on a broader scale. So this is great. And in mobility context, however, unlike in desktop environments, uh, many other scenarios appear. So, you know, you may be, for instance, looking at a recipe uh, to, to, to follow a recipe while you're cooking, for instance, and the device may not actually be in your hands. And in fact, your hands may be busy uh, doing other things. Or uh, in this case here, you may, a person may want to actually be repairing heavy engine and may need some instructions on, on their device. And so the, the ability to be able to browse through those instructions, to be able to acquire that information and go through it in a way that's efficient can be fairly inhibited uh, when you don't have the proper tools, uh, such as you know, if you're given simply a tablet. And this is currently how much of this is being done today. Uh, so there's significant need for us to go beyond this, not only in sort of very specialized applications, but one that ones that can actually be used on a daily basis by, by general end user customers. So there's come a time where you know the idea of having a display around you is is has changing and gradually shifting a little bit, uh, and this sort of was introduced more openly and more widely. Although it's been in the works for a while, the idea of being using a heads-up display, so the display being always available, uh, and there's obviously a certain degree of uh, social discomfort, uh, particularly for those who don't wear glasses, right? And so often in my courses, I ask people, well, how many of you may want to wear such glasses? And most of those times, people who don't wear glasses may not actually find the need for it or may not want to do it. Those wearing glasses may, may do. But it so happens to be a point, I believe, where certain technologies gradually move into our, into our working environment in certain ways. And we don't say that ultimately this is what everyone will be wearing, but the idea that we'll have access to displays around us could be something that's quite pervasive. And so here are some examples of some early displays that people have considered or have designed on such devices. So some very early prototypes. And so you could envision these as being sort of the earlier desktops or Windows systems from the 80s, or even the earlier sort of mobile devices from the early 2000s or late 1990s, uh, sort of emerging on these uh, upcoming platforms. Um, and so, you know, basically transferred the interface of, of uh, sort of a mobile screen you see it over here, it's occluding your view, which is not great. It only allows you to see one screen at a time, again, which is not really ideal for uh, facilitating sense making. So in this work here, we've done, a, uh, and this is the work of Barrett Enns, a past PhD uh, student, um, who, who basically looked at this, uh, the idea of, you know, what it means to, to expand your display space uh, beyond just what you might see in front of you. And not only be, beyond that, but to be able to provide you the same level of multitasking that is commonly needed when you're sense making and when you actually need information uh, to, to be able to make some decisions. Um, and so we go beyond that to be able to implement it actually. And so, so the idea that these can actually, these windows can appear floating around you is, is, is interesting. Uh, and we, we take this idea further to not only place them around the user, but what if they were actually embedded in your physical environment? And so here are some very early examples of how this worked. Uh, I want to note that much of this was done also uh, before uh, devices such as like the, uh, the HoloLens came out on the market where they now we have access or this capability is 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 becoming uh, more possible uh, with some more advanced technologies. Um, so here's something we call the personal facade, which basically scans the user's environment. Uh, and what it's doing is basically interested in putting content in locations that are most appropriate for the user in terms of how they've defined it. And regardless of where they happen to be, whether they happen to be at work or at home, it maintains some level of uh, spatial constancy. 
Uh, to do that, it scans the environment and extracts surfaces from the, from the model of the environment uh, using certain uh, sensing capabilities and basically places these using certain um, uh, heuristics. So some spatial uh, constancy applied with some visual saliency. So in terms of visual saliency, it will try not to overlap the content uh, like the personal cockpit, which didn't have any disregard for the environment. Here, it'll try not to overlap the content with the environment. It could also be people in your environment. So for instance, you don't want your display to occlude the face of someone who's interacting with you socially because that would be quite awkward. Uh, and so the personal facade went uh, one step further to be able to uh, provide such a display environment. And so what's interesting about this is that you in fact can now think about your display not only being your, your screen, but it can actually be the space around you. So if you happen to be at your office, and maybe this office is not the best example because there's a lot around it, uh, but any empty space here can ultimately be used for, for a display and the same could be at your home or any other location that you may be at. It so turns out that we might actually see some of this stuff coming up soon and not just because of our work, but obviously a lot of work that's been done in this space. A student uh, pointed out at, the, at this technologist last week, I believe, that perhaps we'll start seeing uh, displays appear on all our surfaces uh, around us uh, in perhaps the near future. Whether it's good or not, that's something to be, to be studied. And so we can think about, you know, looking at this in various applications, surgical environments, even for everyday uses. So if someone is trying to sense make something about their athletic performance, uh, about, you know, how fast they've been running and how much they've been uh, exercising over a certain period of time, how, how and how to display that content, how to interact with it would be quite important. So I want to shift our attention from the display to the input side again. And then I'll come back talking about both the input and the output. Like I said, the major challenges of being able to do much of this is both interacting on, from an input perspective, but also from an output perspective. Uh, and so in terms of input, um, you, you, you're typically working with sort of mid-air displays. And this is something that you've probably seen and familiar with through movies, popularized through uh, such things as, you know, here's Tony Stark, for instance, in Iron Man. Uh, by the way, such technologies are very difficult to implement. You primarily see them being mocked up in, in movies and in Hollywood. They look great. They look fancy. Uh, the, it has unlimited input and output space, but it's something that actually causes quite a bit of arm fatigue, and it's really unsustainable for any serious length of interaction uh, time. Uh, so we kind of looked at that. So we kind of looked at that to understand a little bit what are the elements of fatigue that are caused when you're trying to interact in this sort of space spatial environment of your device, uh, starting with, you know, all the works that I've shown so far. Uh, and, and we've produced some work where it's, you know, it's very clear that you can't actually do this for very much, uh, for very long periods of time. And so the idea, the question kind of comes as to how do we build technologies to facilitate this input on a more efficient, less fatiguing and more appropriate manner? condition colloquially termed as the gorilla arm effect. The primary means of assessing physical effort for mid-air interaction consists of using qualitative tools such as Lightfoot scale questionnaires, the NASA TLX, and the Borg scale. However, these methods involve a high degree of subjectivity and cannot be as a priori for designing these systems. To obtain an objective measure of effort for mid-air interactions, we propose a new metric called consumed endurance. Consumed endurance is the ratio between the time used for the interaction and the available endurance time, a measure derived from the biomechanical structure of the arm. The implement so I won't go into the details, but basically the summary of that work suggests that if you want to do any mid-air input, uh, you're, you're better off uh, bringing the display or the input space much closer to your body. Uh, so instead of having to extend the arm or, you know, in any different way, for instance, even in the second image here, you're, you're bringing the body, the, the arm closer to you, but it's really not at the ideal position. Uh, the one to the far right is perhaps something where, you know, we typically hold our arms on a daily basis. So don't want to have to lift it up uh, for any sustaining the period of time or even uh, push it out further. And so this has prompted a, a, a number of different designs and techniques. Um, so where, for instance, uh, here we have, this is uh, Barrett again, working on uh, technology where, where, where basically he's using mid-air input for certain things, but also looking at working closer to the body uh, for more refined, precise control of, of, his, of, of the tools and the devices. Uh, so you notice that it's very imprecise. Uh, it, you know, your hand is constantly in air. It's, it's quite, quite um, 
could be quite fatiguing. Uh, but here you could put your hands uh, lower to the body and so with certain sensing capabilities, uh, not even be instrumented, not having an instrument such as a device on your hand, be able to interact with the technologies in fairly precise manners. Uh, so this is something that we looked at uh, a little bit into our, in our lab and we've been able to, to generate some ideas around this and, and we are continuing to explore these, these ideas further. So we can even go further. Now we can think about mid-air displays and mid-air interactions. Well, what about mid-air displays, but body proximate interactions? So if, if some of the guidance is that, you know, perhaps these displays should be coming closer to our, to our physical sphere for input, uh, then, you know, it, that could be something interesting to explore. And so we looked at it in a number of different ways. Uh, this project here was done by Marco Serrano and colleagues um, and, my, and, and, and students when, when Marcos was a postdoc in my lab. Uh, looking at hand-to-face interaction. And here the idea was um, the ability to be able to interact, being very close to oneself. Uh, it's a very interesting, different way of thinking about it. Uh, it's not something that was, uh, that's, it's, it's certainly is something that's very interesting, but uh, as you do the research, you realize, well, you know, if you're making make wearing makeup, for instance, not something that you want to be able to do, uh, or for instance, you know, people are not really, people do touch their faces commonly, but it's not something that you want to be actively uh, engaged with to be able to interact with your devices. Uh, so we are taking this one step further, looking at you know how can we actually move on to specifically on body um, displays and interaction. So where the display and the interaction, so it's not only the interaction is, 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 is on your body, but the display itself is on your body. So this is leading to some uh, vision of being able to display stuff, for instance, on our palm. Uh, and, you know, there's potentially many ways of being able to do this. And so this was a, a paper we published just this year, actually. Uh, and this is work of uh, uh, Ahmed Sharif, a student in the lab, as well as uh, Michael Gamon and uh, several other students looking at how to do this. And so the idea of, you know, body proximate interfaces allows you to be able to use certain sensing capabilities to track certain features, for instance, on our hand, and then to be able to display that. And so I'll just go into a little bit of detail of how one way of being able to doing it is, is possible, uh, just to show that it is actually something that we can do, but there are obviously many ways of doing it and perhaps even many more efficient ways of doing it, which is what we are actually exploring in the, we'll be exploring in the next few uh, months or even a couple of years uh, on our project. Uh, so here's an example of an algorithm that we've uh, in, borrowed from other, other uh, uh, environments where you can project dots on the surface and looking at the deformations on that surface to be able to project your content. So this is still very sort of earlier work on this in this area. So you, the images may appear flashy, but ultimately this is the idea. So this is actually implemented. Now, in this case, the dots are printed, uh, so they, are, they can be visible, but this is obviously not what you want, uh, right? So it makes it work nicely and you can, you can see things projected can be deformed according to the surface, which is often what your hand or your palm is, it's quite deformed and it deforms constantly as you're trying to interact with it. Uh, but ultimately, we want to be able to move from uh, RGB printed display, uh, which you see, to something that are perhaps not visible to the eye. And so what we do is we print or we display infrared points, which are not visible to, your, to the naked eye, but to a camera that doesn't have an infrared filter on it. And so we have a setup like this. It looks obviously a little bit big, something that you wouldn't wear on your body necessarily. Uh, but there is nothing being projected, there are no dots being projected, and that information can be extracted, the deformations can appear uh, quite comfortably, and you can use it. So this is possibly one way of doing it. Uh, it's not necessarily the way that we will uh, further explore, it may be something that we, we don't explore, but it's something that we explored in the past and interested in seeing about this. Uh, the idea behind that is to produce some effects of, of something like this, where you can actually have content appearing on your hand, um, and uh, allowing you to give that flexibility of actually moving the content wherever your hand is. So wherever you may choose to put it, uh, you know, maybe you have it closer to you. Now, obviously when you look at this, you get the impression, well, this is still a very limited display. Uh, and to some extent uh, it can be limited. Um, but the idea is that obviously you have all the space around your hand. So if you use your arm or your hand as a frame of reference, you actually have a fairly large unlimited input output space. And so this is something that we are quite interested in exploring still how to actually work in the space and how to actually work between the space and the other potential spaces you may have in your environment, such as your screens, uh, typical desktop screens, uh, projections on the environment and so on. So with this, I'd like to end uh, my talk. It's uh, basically a, a number of different projects that I've presented in looking at how to facilitate, what are some of the foundations we believe in terms of input and output, so in terms of interaction and display space, 
uh, to, to facilitate sort of decision making. So where you may want to produce sufficient amount of information and interact with it as you may typically do on, 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 on regular desktops. Uh, we're hoping to integrate such interactivity in, in users' daily tasks. So the idea is not to simply browse for the sake of browsing, but to have these kinds of tools as a companion when you're doing other things. So for instance, when may, maybe you're landscaping, you may want to look at certain plans or when you're cooking or, or when you're, for, for instance, maybe you're installing some equipment or furniture or whatever it may be, how could such tools and how could such interfaces work in our environment, in our immediate environment, and so how can we facilitate such interaction? And, and we believe that perhaps, uh, you know, everyday sense making can actually lead to an era of body proximate and near surface user interfaces. So it's possible that such types of interfaces may be something that we're coming up in, in the next decade or, or less. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, and and thank uh, the university, uh, NSERC and the CRC program, as well as all the students who work very hard uh, obviously on, on these projects and who allowed me to, to present this summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Furang, for a very interesting talk and lots of interesting applications. I'm sure there's a lot more that you didn't have the time to talk about today, but maybe some of the questions sure. might trigger that. <laughs> sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we'll move to the questions. So for those of you who came uh, a bit late to, to ask your questions, uh, go to slido.com, enter event code 361. So we have a few questions already for you, Puran. Mm -hmm. um, the first question, hope you can see it, uh, it's from Marco. How can this active sense-making device tool be used in the health industry or to monitor one's health? Yes, that's one of the early devices you talked about early in your talk. Ah, uh, yes. Uh, okay, so active sense making tools. So yes, yeah, so earlier on, I talked about perhaps in sort of health industry when I was giving some examples, they're more what I refer to as earlier passive sense making tools. So tools that inform the user as they're uh, behaving in a certain way. Um, in the health industry, actually, it turns out that some of these tools have already been experimented with in terms of how can one actually um, uh, work with information content as, for instance, they are working on, say, doing surgery, or maybe their hands are not available in a certain tasks, and they want to be able to interact with it, be able to see certain displays. Uh, oftentimes, they actually are dealing with uh, a certain amount, so in, ter in, cer in certain surgical environments, perhaps, uh, they have uh, more than one display that's often required, uh, where they need to perhaps navigate a surgical tool uh, to be able to get to a certain part of the body. Uh, so this has been something that's been experimented with uh, uh, and people have looked at it, not only in the context of what I've been presenting here, but also in other contexts where you can actually overlay that information on, for instance, the patient's body or in, 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 in the environment in which you're working. In terms of interactivity, like I said, in, in sort of healthcare environments, and if I'm un understanding this question properly, uh, the, the ability to actually hold things is, is limited because you're often holding things that are needed for your task itself. And so um, what is important is to facilitate the idea of interaction with such interfaces without having the person to be interrupted from their core task. You don't want your surgeon uh, to leave certain tools at their side to be able to actually interact with certain interfaces. From my understanding, even in some contexts, the interaction happens with things like foot pedals, uh, but also you have assistance to the doctor who may actually go through the information space and, and the doctor themselves or the surgeon themselves might have very limited access. And so the hope is to be able to transfer this into uh, into those kinds of environments and into those spaces. So hopefully that's answered the question a little bit. Um, happy to uh, receive a follow-up question to that, if it makes sense. Yeah. Thanks. I actually like that fork you showed at the very beginning with this person eating and trying to <laughs> slow him down. I need one of those. Where can you get them from? <laughs> uh, you can speak with my student, Zoe Zhang, and uh, he is sort of the him and a few other students in the lab are kind of the, the brains behind that project. So uh, it's, it's still very early stage prototype, uh, but obviously it looks big and everything. But yeah, it, I believe it's something that has quite a bit of potential uh, and something that actually prompted also based on my eating behaviors, uh, which happens to be quite, sort of quite fast. Um, uh, so yes, so yeah, that was yeah, interesting. you when it's ready for sure. <laughs> <laughs> the next question. Um... Can you see it? Yeah. With alternative user interfaces, like the one around device systems, have you observed users having difficulties learning 
to use these new user interfaces. Right. So that's a very important question. The learnability of these interfaces is, is something that we haven't explored fully. Um, in fact, we, to a large extent, it's sort of a, sort of a double-edged sword in the sense that when you're doing gestural interaction, it's, these gestures are somewhat hidden. You, in fact, when you look at a touchpad on certain laptops, you don't quite know if you use two fingers or three fingers, what it's going to do. Uh, so they are hidden, but the, on the flip side, when you do see someone doing it, or if you've done it once, you can relocate or find how to doing it. It becomes quite easy to replicate. Uh, and I think Apple was quite good at doing this. In fact, uh, you know, if you think about our interactions on our smartphones, which involve flicking, pinching for zooming in or out, uh, it's something that we do subconsciously. But Apple actually ran a many marketing campaigns before the products were on the market, where if you remember, this was in the late 2007, six and so on, when these were coming out, where you had people sort of with these uh, earphones uh, dancing, for instance, to music and with the iPhone, and they were just flicking and zooming. And so not only was it a marketing campaign, but it was actually a, a very much a training tool to help people figure out you know, how to simply use this. And then if you see now today, uh, you have toddlers who observe their parents and they can actually use an iPad uh, fairly comfortably. So, uh, so the learnability of such systems is certainly critical, uh, but uh, the hope is that ultimately when it becomes fairly common, people can observe these interactions and be able to do them, do them appropriately. Great, thank you. The next question, how important is social accept acceptability for new designs? If the improved functionality is great enough, can it be assumed that accept acceptability yeah. will come with time? That's, a, that's again, a very good question, yes. Um, that's true. I think there's sort of this trade-off that we observe in equipment, you know? So you could, you could obviously go around with a Bluetooth earpiece, and some people do because the value it brings to our daily lives is far greater than the awkwardness of having a Bluetooth earpiece uh, hanging around us. Uh, so certainly technologies, when they have a certain value, uh, up to a certain extent, regardless of how awkward or weird they may seem, um, they, they get adopted. But it's a very important question to observe because depending on the context in which you want the technology to be deployed in, that social acceptability could either uh, make it or kind of break it in some way, if you want to say. Um, uh, I, 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 as an example, uh, you know, exactly the, the same thing with the ear, Bluetooth earpiece. It's a, it seems to be a very practical tool, but only for very few use cases. You don't really see many people, at least I don't see many people wearing them. So one could consider, well, what is it about this technology if it's really great to, to, to allow us to not have to wear it or uh, to prevent us from wearing it? And so it's, it's quite an important question, I believe, social acceptability for new designs, to be able to study them in certain contexts and to refine and to, uh, to be integrated in the user's experience that they want to have or see on a daily basis. Uh, and again, obviously, there's this sort of point where, you know, the technology and the features it brings to our daily use is far greater than its awkwardness, uh, then we might still adopt them and still be able to work on them. Great, thank you. The next question, in the hand display project, the hand may not be stable. With moving content, will it be easier for the user to view the content well and interact with it? Uh, it's a good question. I think um, it's, it's that project is still very early stages. Uh, I think we have lots of questions around it, not only from the perspective of um, how to implement it from a te technology perspective, but from the perspective of also, um, like you say, uh, usability uh, and a content information display. Um, the hand is not stable, but there are, there are certain things that you, we could do you know, in terms of stability. Um, if, if you think about it, our, when we hold a mobile device like a smartphone, we are fairly accurate at selecting things on the device, even though it it is something that our fingers have to sort of mold around to hold it, right? So when I'm holding this device, it actually, there's a certain awkwardness to doing it. So we believe that when it's on your hands, you kind of get rid of that in some ways, and it's simply there. Um, now, in terms of the instability of it, you know, like I said, there could be certain things that we do in the future, uh, but um, uh, that's something that we haven't gotten to yet. Yeah. All right, the next thing is a comment from John. Thank you for this fascinating talk. 
I didn't even know this type of technology was at this stage of development. I thought it was only on things like Star Trek. <laughs> Well, thank you for the comment, John. Yes, and in fact, it's 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 a. Uh, oftentimes, you know, people in the movies and in movie industries tend to foresee, and you know, science, science science fiction is really great at this: is to be able to put in people's minds and in their eyes these technologies of the future. Uh, but it actually, when it comes down to implementing some of these, it it becomes extremely difficult. So, if you want something like the holodeck. Uh, uh, or even some of the communicating capabilities of Star Trek, I think you are very, very far from having those today. Uh, but certainly, I think Star Trek was also something that was envisioned for being very much in the future. And it's possible that in some ways we may be able to beat certain uh, deadlines or certain timelines that we had seen perhaps in, in those movies such as Star Trek. So so it's, it's all up in the air, but um, certainly uh, it, it is an inspiration it's a very much an inspiration to students, to to people in this field, uh, to be able to develop technologies that um, that sci-fi has to some extent envisioned. Did you watch a lot of sci-fi or read sci-fi books in your childhood? <laughs> Not in my childhood, no. Not at all. I was mostly familiar to it when I moved to Canada. So. <laughs> all right. Uh, next question: In the hand display project, the hand. Oh, we did. I think we did that one. Already, right? Yeah, that one. Yeah, we did that one. Sorry. Uh, the next question is from Janet. What does the movement detection ever look like for these interfaces? What does the movement error detection error look like for? So, if I can, if I'm interpreting this right, I think what I'm understanding from this question is uh, the ability to select items. Um, how accurate are we in selecting content and being able to? When you say movement, I'm assuming finger movement and so on. Um, it's a lot of this work, and particularly the last part of this work, is very much in 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 flux. Um, we are starting to see some of that on, in virtual reality interfaces, so things like the Oculus headsets, uh, sort of VR headsets. Uh, they are, to some extent, they're able to actually track our fingers and hands to a certain degree of high fidelity. Uh, but they are still extremely, extremely limited. So once you actually start digging into how they work. Uh, for being able to do doing certain things that we are envisioning, they they actually don't they they are not, not able to use them. Uh, so, fortunately, in our lab, to build a lot of these technologies, we actually use uh, motion capture systems. So, and this is CFI funded, uh, fortunately for us, and we are able to to use these heavy duty systems that allow us to track with a fairly high precision the movements of the fingers, of the arms, and the bodies, and so on and so forth. So when it comes to experimenting and digging into the user experience and understanding that user experience uh, to then ultimately help us build and implement and engineer these interfaces for future devices, uh, we have some foundation. We're not starting from scratch. Uh, and and so, if, so it's sort of like a chicken and egg thing. Like if you were to use camera sensing capabilities to understand that user experience, we could spend years, if not decades, just improving on the sort of computer vision technologies and the machine learning technologies to get the right models, to get the right movement models, the right hand models. Uh, and by then, you know, that technology may become stale already. So from our perspective, we are quite, quite fortunate that we are able to, to look at these earlier on and then to ideally be able to guide the design of the, the systems when they actually get deployed and when they actually get engineered into actual working systems without the equipment that we're using. So without the motion capture equipment. And it's the motion capture equipment that we're using for precision, high precision is, is very similar to what we see in uh, movies uh, for generating uh, computer generated movies and so on and so forth. All right, thank you. I hope that answered your question, Janet. Uh, the next question from John, are there options for input besides by hand, such as foot movement, voice, etc.? Good question. Yeah, there, there are many. Uh, in fact, uh, foot movement has been something that's been explored for a long time. So things like foot pedals, and in fact, those devices exist. Uh, voice is becoming common. Uh, so things like Alexa, and you know, they're starting to see it. Obviously, we're seeing it on our mobile devices more commonly, even in our home, home devices. Um, I think the the thing about input or the way to interact with the computers is that it's 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 what referred to in our environment or in our in our research as being multimodal so it's not only that hand input or hand gestures uh, is the end all be all uh, if you look at how we interact with our desktops today we have a keyboard to enter text 
and but we have a mouse to be able to select on buttons and we have a mouse to you know click on items if you were to use a mouse or a cursor to select items on a keyboard to do text entry uh, we would probably give it give up that interface very quickly so we need our keyboard there's nothing we can do without our keyboard so we need a keyboard on our laptops on our desktops but we also need our mouse because it's extremely precise for doing certain things uh, so Yes, there are many options besides the hands. And I think when, depending on the context, depending on the application, these other modalities become important. And in some cases, they might even be more important than our hands. Um, so, so for instance, for assistive technologies, uh, where voice might be import, more important, or even head gestures, you know, moving your head, for instance, uh, could be important. Yeah, I think it's becoming more important, uh, this pandemic era, where you have to avoid touching yeah. anything. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good comment. Yes. These, these mid-air gestures, um, you wonder sometimes, you know, when, when will it be when these things are kind of prime time? And uh, as we're starting with this pandemic, there, there's sort of a lot of thought around the fact that, you know, maybe maybe this these, these sort of touchless gesture interaction systems might be something that becomes common, but perhaps more in sort of public spaces when you'd have to interact with devices that are more public. So you may not see touch screen kiosks anymore in a, in a mall, uh, but maybe something else. So. Yeah, and it's also good for accessibility and inclusion. Which is, yeah. You don't want to just rely on your hands. Right. Okay, yeah, that was a great question. Thank you. The next question is from Harold. Last question. How does a sleep app on your iPhone know when you are actually sleeping as opposed to being awake? That's a that's a great question. And actually, I don't know the answer to, <laughs> to that question, Harold, unfortunately. Um, I don't know how our sleep app on your iPhone knows uh, when I'm sleeping. Um, it's, 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 it's like this question. I mean, when you think about some of these devices, so, so it actually, so it's an interesting point because it leads to, it leads to some of the earlier stuff that I discussed in terms of being able to sense passively, for instance, uh, how fast you're eating uh, or what you may be eating or what's your calorie intake. I think to a large extent, um, it, I could, it could be safe to say that maybe these technologies are not 100% uh, accurate, right? And I think we observe that. Uh, but I think at the same time, we are, we are sort of accepting of technologies at that level uh, for the benefit that they may provide us. So for instance, you know, if you have to walk 10,000 steps a day, but really, it's not really computing 10,000 steps in the most accurate way. We, we still get a sense that we have done enough activity when you get close to say 9,000 or whatever it may be, because you know you may be done a bit more than you did yesterday or the day before. Um, so from that perspective, the sensing becomes very important, how you design the sensing capabilities. And I'm assuming they're using a bunch of biometrics from you know the user's detection, the motion of the user's movement in bed and so on and so forth. Um, but yes, the sensing of these devices is something that's extremely important to have to have done down accurately to be able to provide information that's that's useful and that people can act on. Great, thank you. The last comment from Janet again, who asked you the error questions. Thank you, that, that, that did answer my question perfectly. Thank and thank you for the great talk. Thank you. Um, and I do, that was the last comment. So I do also second that. Thank you very much, Purang, for a wonderful yeah. talk. Thank fascinating you. applications. I'm, I'm sure lots of students listening to you are getting more interested in your research now. Uh, and you get more students as a result. Uh, so that ends your part of the uh, talk. So we'll go back to um, this. And uh, I would like to also advertise our next speaker for next Friday, July 31st. Uh, we'll go back to our alumni and the next talk will be by Theo Srivastava, uh, who's a, a graduate from our microbiology uh, co-op program. Uh, and he's an account manager at the binding site. So he's gonna tell us all about change, change happens, and also about career choices, uh, about the industry world versus the science academic world. So looking forward to that, stay tuned, and we hope to see many of you next week. Uh, last but not least, I'd like to thank uh, our spot support team shown here, who works behind the scene for uh, 
uh, promoting the series and uh, making it possible. And of course, thanks again to all of our speakers. We'll keep going until the end of the summer. So uh, we hope to see many of you again uh, next Friday and the coming Fridays. Uh, I'd like to remind everyone uh, or inform everyone that these talks uh, can be replayed uh, on the YouTube links that you're receiving. They're also all posted on the Faculty of Science YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to visit, revisit uh, or visit or share with your friends and colleagues. Um, with that, I'd like to thank you all again for making us part of your day. Uh, and we hope to see you next Friday. Until then, have a great weekend. And thank you so much again, Purang. Take care. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for your time. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.